In this video, we're going to take a look at the metal activity series and we'll determine how certain elements are more reactive than others. So the metal activity series identifies how likely a metal will act as a reducing agent. So metals high on the list are more likely to undergo oxidation than those lower down on the list. This means that metals higher up will also be more reactive as well. So if you take a look at this list, lithium, cesium, rubidium, potassium, alkali metals, they're much more likely to undergo oxidation, so they're much more reactive. And then you move down the list, barium, strontium, calcium, so these are our group two elements, and then group three elements, and so on, and some of our transition metals. So we can see that the most reactive are here at the top, the least reactive are at the bottom, platinum, gold, we know that those are pretty stable. Um, metals that don't undergo a lot of oxidation so they don't corrode, for instance, which is a redox reaction, remember? So we can look at this series and actually find out whether or not a reaction is likely to happen. So if we were trying to do a single displacement reaction with a metal and a solution, an ionic solution, if the metal is higher on the series than the metal that's in the compound or the solution, a reaction will happen. But if it's lower down, no reaction will happen. So it will not displace the metal in solution. So in these types of reactions, we have to look and predict whether or not a reaction will happen. So the first reaction, we have iron trying to displace sodium and sodium iodide. So already, um, when you look at the metal activity series, even before you look at that, sodium is an alkali metal, it's more reactive than iron. So in this case, there is not going to be a reaction that occurs. So we're just going to write NR for no reaction. So we don't need to balance this equation because there's no reaction. The next one, sodium is trying to displace magnesium from magnesium oxide. Um, sodium is an alkali metal, so it's high on the list. Magnesium is actually just below sodium. Um, so this reaction will happen, so we now need to do the crossover rule. So it's going to be magnesium plus sodium oxide, but oxygen has a charge of uh, minus 2 and sodium has a charge of plus 1. So the compound is going to be Na2O. We now need to balance this equation. So we have two um, sodiums on the right sides. We need to put a 2 here, but everything else is balanced. The rest will all be 1s. Now if we take a look at silver, it's almost at the bottom of the list. The only thing below silver is palladium, mercury, platinum, and gold. So lead is higher. So this is also a no reaction. And then the final one, sodium, alkali metal. Calcium is an alkaline earth metal, so it's lower down. So this reaction will happen too. It's going to be the same thing. So we're going to have calcium all by its lonesome now and sodium oxide. So again, we need to balance by putting a 2 here. So this table just demonstrates some of the reactivity of metals in, with, in certain circumstances. So to the far left, we have our activity series. So we've got, it's a short and more condensed one. So potassium, calcium, sodium, magnesium, down to gold. So when you react with dilute acid, these metals will produce hydrogen gas, but with decreasing vigor. So potassium more so than so calcium and so on. And then as you get lower down, copper, silver, etc., do not react with dilute acids. Over here, reaction with air and oxygen, these at the top burn very brightly and vigorously. And then, so that would be the alkali metals and then they will the next ones will burn to form an oxide with decreasing vigor as you go down and then these ones react slowly to form the oxide and then platinum and gold do not react at all and then reaction with water so potassium and so on they produce hydrogen gas with decreasing vigor with cold water and then the next ones down would react with steam with, again, decreasing vigor. And then lower down on the list, they don't react with cold water or steam at all. And then the ease of extraction, potassium, calcium, sodium are hard to extract because, because they're so reactive. 
Um, as you go down, they become easier and easier. And eventually they're just found as the element because they aren't so reactive. So they are found not um, in um, association with other things. They're just found as the native element. So you're going to do an investigation um, one of the prescribed practicals for IB is to create a metal activity series and this protocol is actually taken from Cognini's textbook. Um, you're going to react several metals with solutions that contain the same metals. So if you take a look at the example here, um, down the left hand side each row is filled with a sample of each metal. So we have zinc metal, magnesium metal, copper metal and lead. Um, in our investigation, we won't use lead because it's uh, it's not so great to handle and then it's not so great to get rid of. So we use iron or something else, something a little less toxic. And then we'll have in the column solutions of each of those um, metals. So a zinc solution, a magnesium solution, a copper and a lead in their example. So you'll add a few drops of each metal ion solution um, to each of the pieces of metal. You'll observe each combination and dis determine if a displacement reaction is taking place. So some ways to know if a displacement reaction is taking place is you'll see a color change either in the solution and or on the metal sample. And you might see bubbles of gas as well. There might even be some heat released. So those would all be clues that a reaction is happening. Then you'll record your results in a suitable table and describe the signs that a displacement reaction was actually taking place in the solution. This is an example of some sample, like a sample investigation that could happen, also taken from Cognity and their explanation. So in this example, they had copper, iron, magnesium, and zinc as the metals, and then their metal solutions, copper, iron, magnesium, zinc. So if you look, copper did not react at all. So the X's mean that there was no change. So there's no change to copper in the copper solution, the iron solution, the magnesium solution, or the zinc solution. Nothing happened. The next one, iron reacted with copper, but it didn't react with any of the others. So it was only able to displace copper from the solution. Magnesium reacted with copper, iron, and zinc. It didn't react with magnesium because it's the same thing. So there's no net change when magnesium tries to displace magnesium in a solution. Um, it's the same ions. And then zinc reacted with copper and iron, but not with magnesium or zinc. So you can then determine what one was most reactive. So the one that had the most check marks would be the one that is the most reactive metal. So that would be, in this case, be magnesium. So we put that at the top. And then the one that reacted the next most often was zinc, followed by iron, followed by copper that didn't react at all. So that would be our metal activity series. And then you could compare it to an actual metal activity series to see if your classifications were correct. So now we're gonna practice writing net ionic equations. So the first thing that you're to do is to write the balanced molecular equation. So magnesium plus copper sulfate solution makes magnesium sulfate solution and copper. The first thing you have to do is separate any of the aqueous species and write the ionic equations. So again, magnesium plus copper two plus plus sulfate ions makes magnesium two plus plus sulfate plus copper. The third step is to cross off spectator ions, so something that appears on both sides of the equation. So the sulfate is considered a spectator ion, so we would cross those off, and now you rewrite the equation. So magnesium plus copper 2 plus makes magnesium 2 plus plus copper, and then you rewrite it into the half equations. Um, so magnesium breaks apart into magnesium 2 plus plus two electrons that it's giving to copper two plus, and then copper two plus plus the two electrons that it so happened to take from magnesium becomes copper. So that is how you write out net ionic equations. So in this example, we're being asked to write the net ionic half reactions for the following reaction. So magnesium solid reacting with copper two chloride solution makes magnesium chloride solution plus copper. 
So the first thing we have to do, we've already got the equation written out, but now we need to break them apart into ions, anything that's aqueous. So we're going to write Mg solid plus Cu2 plus plus 2Cl minus makes Mg2 plus plus 2Cl minus plus copper. Now we need to cross off spectator ions. So the two spectator ions would be the chloride. So we rewrite that, or actually we can just leave it as is. Now we're going to write the two half equations. So we have magnesium makes magnesium two plus plus two electrons, and then copper two plus 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 two electrons makes copper solid. So that's how you do that one. So one redox reaction that we're all familiar with is rust. So rusting is a redox reaction that needs oxygen and liquid water to occur. So the first thing that happens is iron is oxidized to iron two ions. So we can see here iron becomes iron 2 plus aqueous plus 2 electrons. Oxygen gets reduced to hydroxide ions, so oxygen gas with water. So that's where the water is required. Plus 4 electrons makes 4 hydroxide ions. When we combine the half reactions, we have the 2Fe plus O2 plus 2H2O makes 2Fe2 plus plus 4 hydroxide ions. And what happens is the, the Fe, the iron hydroxide, iron 2 hydroxide precipitate oxidizes in basic conditions to form hydrated iron 3 oxide, um, a red flaky substance. And that's what we know as rust. And when that flakes off, you actually lose some of the iron and then that's how things can rust out. So there are many ways you can prevent rust, and they're actually kind of interesting. So one of them, you can put a waterproof barrier, like oil. So sometimes you'll get your car undercoated so that um, it doesn't rust out. Um, so an oil or some sort of water barrier is placed on your car. Or you can paint the surface. So when you paint a car, you're protecting it, the iron below, from oxidation and like reduction reactions. But the problem is the barrier can be breached through weathering or scratching. So when you get a, a scratch or um, abrasion on your car, now there's a point of access for the oxidation to happen. Now there's another method, which is kind of cool, and you can see it in this picture here. You see all these weird like discs on this surface. It's called sacrificial protection. So you're using the principles of electrochemistry so you put blocks of magnesium or zinc on pipes or other metal surfaces, and then they'll undergo corrosion first because they're more reactive than iron. So they sacrifice themselves for the good of the iron. So the iron is prevented from rusting because they're oxidizing and, and corroding first. So for added practice, you can complete the section questions for section 9.13 um, and then um, check your work through Cognity. The solutions are worked out at each question.